start the meeting. Call the meeting to order. Any agenda changes, Dan? Yes, we have two agenda changes. Uh, we have an errors and admission from the Lister's office. And we have a point uh, transportation advisory committee representative. Other than that, uh, I checked everybody's online. So, approve the minutes of the November 19th meeting. So moved. Bob? Bob Beeman. Okay. Second. Yeah, it's Gary, I'll second it, but it's uh, November 16th, I think. What did I say? 19th, you said. Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. So the 16th, uh, Gary second in. Any further? In favor, Bob? Aye. Eric? Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy? I people need to mute if they're not talking, please. Thank you. Okay. Motion passes. Minutes concerns. Hearing none. Zoning changes. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. This is Todd Thomas speaking. Uh, we're doing a second zoning change in 2020 at the select board's direction, mainly to benefit the Fairwood Parkway area, uh, senior meeting packages, and on um, the public notice, which I'm just going to reference that. There are a few other changes that are part of the package. I'm just going to, there's only a few. I'm going to go through them, uh, there's only 10 items. I'm going to go through them line by line. If anyone has any questions, just yell hold or ask a question, and we'll tackle it then. Don't need to wait till the end. Uh, hey, Todd. Yeah. Excuse me, Todd. This is Eric. I think it's going to be a lot easier if you're up to the table. If the echo in the room and your elevated voice aren't a good mix, I'm having trouble understanding you. Agreed. Yeah, mm -hmm. so do I. <laughs> All right. How's that? Better? Better. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. In the select board packet, is the zoning change hearing start from page or that four or five after the minutes. So, about a quarter of the way in, there's the hearing notice. Uh, we're working off the same thing public notice, warm hearing. There's items A through J at the bottom of the hearing. That's what I'm working off of right now. So, how, everyone has that? Yes. Okay. Yep. On number, on number A, Class 2 development industrial zone. That's more of a housekeeping correction. That's just basically acknowledging that there is no uh, store service on east of Pool Avenue, uh, Pool Avenue frontage east. So that's just basically correcting something that should have been corrected 20 years ago. So shouldn't be any concerns there. I'll keep going unless someone says something. Uh, B. Add steep slope protections to environmental resource areas. This bylaw came out of a conservation proposal to prohibit development on Elmore Mountain and to require 10 acre minimum lot sizes. The planning council was uh, did not want to just single out a, a, a particular neighborhood, so instead they came up with a town wide proposal to receive development on steep slopes. And really, that was at the that was really what the Conservation Commission was trying to do. That's why they were looking at Elmore Mountain in the neighborhood anyway. So what the zoning change would do is uh, it doesn't prohibit any development. It requires if a house, a septic system, or any outbuildings, like a garage or barn is proposed on steep slopes of 20% or more, that it goes to the DRB, an administrative permit can't be granted for it. So again, nothing's prohibitive. There is more red tape to it. There is gonna be more cost for the homeowner because they go to the DRB and have a, a more professional site plan drawn up. 
So it basically takes the power from the DA and the homeowner puts in the hands of the DRB and the DRB just makes sure that due care is being undertaken when a development, when steep slopes are being converted. Uh, to be clear, this doesn't regulate driveways, doesn't regulate roads, only regulates the footprint of the house, septic system, outbuildings. It also would regulate a, a commercial building or commercial parking lot. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the kind of compromise proposal that came out of the Conservation Commission's 10 acre lot minimum proposal, which the Planning Commission voted down. Any so questions? Todd, I have a question. Yeah, um, so that means it's not prohibitive of like driveways. Um, so the driveway can still be steep and you can have your house lot there as long as you've got it plateaued off. Correct, right? or, the DR, or the, nothing that says the DRB can't allow development on the 25% slope. It just requires Correct. additional use. The DRB will put conditions on it for stormwater or for erosion or who knows, I can't speak to the DRB, but it still could be, it doesn't regulate a driveway whatsoever, Bob. If you want to put it up your house okay. for your driveway and the fire truck can't get to it, uh, it's your issue when the house is on fire. It's not something you're trying to regulate via zoning. Okay, understood. Any other questions on that one? I thought there'd be a lot of questions on this one. It's the first time we're regulating a steep slope for the community, so um, it's a, it's, it, this one is somewhat of a significant change. Even though it's not prohibiting it, development, it still sends pro more projects to the DRB. Yeah, it's the first one I've seen it that way. Correct. Yeah, as uh, typical, we'll probably get more questions about it uh, after we go through the first one or two applications. That's usually when we uh, carry out the, the out. problems with any any regulation. Yeah. Now, whenever you do yeah. something new, you always work the bugs out the first two applications. You come back with minor revisions for the third and fourth next zoning change. I agree. Yep. Any other questions on that one? This is a public hearing. Again, we're not voting tonight. We're just taking public comments, asking questions tonight. You guys are plan are scheduled to vote on this at your January something meeting or so. The first meeting in January. Uh, you could vote on this actually at your next meeting, but I'm not, I wasn't sure at the time you're having a, a meeting on December 21st. So you could vote on this on the 21st. You could also vote on it January 4th. I've got the trustees voting January 6th. I'm expecting changes from this board more than those the trustees. So I've got you guys in the batter's box for a first. So it sounds like January 4th is the uh, when you vote on it. So again, not going yeah, to it'd be nice. Comments. Sorry, Todd. Question. Right, it'd be nice to have uh, have all the folks that were present um, a little while back there to be, make sure they all know about that meeting and are present. Would you like me to be folks up on Elmore Mountain? Well, no, I'm not. I'm just talking. I'm talking about all the zoning changes, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, everyone who's got a, I mean, the steep slope protection is a townwide proposal. I mean, there are steep slopes that run through the downtown even, so it's it's got significant breadth in that in that regard. Any actual zones that got that are getting changed, like the Fairwood Parkway one. At the planning level, yeah. everyone sent a letter, so everyone knows about it in Fairwood Parkway. I can't send everyone a letter in town for steep slope protection. I can't really, I right. can't look at really in a realistic time fashion who would impact who it doesn't down down by parcel ID. So not everyone got a letter on steep slopes. It did this did get discussed literally on like ten different planning council agendas. So this isn't a surprise. Right. I was I was just thinking about Fairwood Parkway anyway. Yeah, Fairwood Parkway. They all got letters at the planning level. I'm assuming you get a couple of favorite Parkway people on the call tonight. Okay. All right, moving on from steep slopes, last chance. Uh, on C, uh, codify existing treatment of temporary structures. Uh, this is basically, we're codifying what I do now. You're putting up a pop-up garage for the winter, you're taking it down in the spring, it doesn't need a permit. One year becomes a permanent structure, anything less than a temporary structure. We're just basically saying that the zoning bylaw that we have handled this for the last decade plus. Moving on on that one, that's pretty simple stuff. Now, D is housekeeping too. Uh, there's less language in there right now that the DA has to renew expired permits. Uh, I don't think that should be there. I think the DA should have some discretion. 
there really isn't much of a change here because the ZA doesn't renew a permit, they appeal it to the DRB anyway, and that's where we go regardless. So this just gives a little discretion that the ZA, if you don't agree with the ZA renewing your permit after it's expired, um, you go to the DRB regardless. So not much of a change there. Uh, on number five, reward accessory parts regulations. I gave the select board a separate piece of paper on the page prior to the warning you're looking at. So section 423, accessory apartments. Um, what we're trying, I'm doing this to try to tweak what's actually warned. Uh, we just went through an accessory apartment application at the DRB level for Prudy Newton and the DRB denied the application uh, because they, were, they, are, they found the language problematic. So I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone and play with section 423.4 while we have it in front of us. It's the section kind of in yellow if you print it in color. If you guys have a black and white print, it's the gray area. So uh, the issue came up when most accessory apartments are built or convert are built adjacent to in a garage an existing single family home or are built as part of a sectioned off section of a single family home. We don't see many see many new housing starts that includes a, a primary structure and an accessory structure within the same building. That's what happened with Prudy Newton's case with DRB denied. So I'm trying to add some language in that speaks to both how an accessory apartment is calculated the maximum size within an existing building and within a newly proposed building when it's part of that same footprint. So that's what the language is trying to do here. Gary might have some more thoughts on this. Since, uh, this this uh, revision came forth as part of the uh, in a DRB hearing, and this is also on the planning council agenda tomorrow night to tweak to see if they need to tweak the language further. So, if we need additional clarification, we can get that then. But, Gary, you want to start or chime in here? Well, I, yeah, I'd like to chime in. I just, it's, it still seems convoluted to me. Um, I think it needs some more work. I'm not, uh, I guess I'd like to sit down with Todd and, um, well, after the planning council gets done with it tomorrow night, we'll see what it comes out looking like. But uh, then I'll look at it again and then maybe sit down with Todd. It's still, I mean, if you read the thing, uh, if the board could take time to just read that uh, 423.4 paragraph B and <laughs> see if you can figure it out right off quick like. And Gary, again, the planning council is going to work with us tomorrow night. We may have some. This is, our, this is already warned, so we may revise the language a little further, um, some more minor revisions to clarify it to satisfy those concerns. I can't speak for the planning council. We'll see what comes out of that process tomorrow night. Right. Yeah. No, I understand, and that's why I said after they after they do what they want to do with it tomorrow night, I'll take another look at it and uh, from the DRB side and see if it will pass muster but like I say I'd appreciate it if the board members would just take a quick read through that and see if see if you can understand it right off quick like yeah I'm I wondering, here, you know, it's not clear no I wonder Todd is there any way you could put like an example in yeah the planning council may ask me uh, I've already heard we may do a drawing or two drawings in there of what it looks like for an accessory partner to take up a uh, portion of an existing building or uh, a drawing showing accessory apartment proposed as part of a new building. So the kind of how, that, how the math works out in both of those. So that, that sounds means, good. Yeah, that example may be visual. I'll see what they want to do tomorrow night. Well, the, okay. I mean, if you read the thing, to me, it, it's still uh, in the first line, you can have a proposed accessory apartment not greater than 60% of the total floor space of the existing primary dwelling or greater than 40% of the total floor space of any new structure. I, got, I can't get through my thick head why you're allowed 60% of an existing primary dwelling but only 40% of a brand new dwelling. That's, and the board members yeah. picked up on it. Todd, Todd can vouch for it. I mean, we had quite a discussion over the over the Newton project, and it yeah, it was so uh, I guess convoluted if to say that um, we couldn't we couldn't really figure out you know uh, 
seven members came up with seven different answers, you know. Yeah, I think on yeah. the existing language with a Newton application, I think the board ended up with three, possibly four different interpretations of the existing language, not what's in front of the board tonight, and we discussed it for over two hours total. So we're trying to obviously fix that. I don't think we're quite to the finish line yet, but I think it's better than what we got. We'll see what comes out of tomorrow night. But I'm yeah, happy rather than beat a dead horse here. Rather than yeah, beat this to death, let's uh, let's wait and see what the planning council comes up with, and um, we'll take another shot at it. Okay. Any other questions? Sounds good to me. All right, moving on. Except um, campaign signs. Uh, right now, regulations say 30 days prior. You can't have campaign signs up more than 30 days prior to the election. This was a different election with the amount of mail-in voting that we've had in the past with presidential election. We were voting here, I think, 48 days prior to election day. So that means you put the ZA, with myself, obviously, within a spot where for three weeks or two, for the greater part of two and a half weeks, you people were voting and voting for president, voting for local offices where campaign signs were legal. So I, I'm trying to expand the campaign sign allotment from 30 days to 60 days to make sure when people are voting, candidates can have their signs out. Um, I didn't take a single campaign sign during election season. I try not to. It never ends well when you touch campaign signs. Um, but in theory, I should have been taking every campaign sign in town for the better part of two and a half weeks with the existing zoning. So that's why I'm trying to fix it from 30 to 60 days, which will solve that problem with the early voting that's going to be more common, at least, in the, at least for the foreseeable future, maybe not long term. But as of right now, it's going to be the next couple of elections, I still think. Also yeah, so we'll no yeah Gary, I agree with that. Um, is there a is there an end date when they need to be? I mean, like a week after uh, election, should they be all picked up? Is there anything in the regulations about that? Yeah, I think it's 72 hours are supposed to be going. I have taken campaign signs. I should qualify my statement. I've taken some campaign signs and tossed them in the dumpster since the election's been over. I waited a good week and a half to do that. Uh, but I didn't touch any during the election until the election was over. But in the bylaw, any signage, any temporary signage like that is supposed to be gone uh, 72 hours after the event, I believe. Okay, that's fine. All right, 840.8. Uh, Gary may chime in here again. We're setting wet hydrant locations and requiring dry hydrants in major rural subdivisions. So uh, right now, the Zoning bylaw is very vague. It just says uh, hydrants uh, when you're on the village water system for the fire chief. We'd like to give applicants a little more direction than that. So there's actually some specifications in there uh, where the hydrants should go. Uh, that was done with the fire chief and with the local engineer. Uh, the dry hydrants, were just, so the wet hydrants I'm not expecting any issues with. The dry hydrants, um, uh, there are some people who take issues with that with rural areas. The DRB uh, has discussed this for a while. The planning council is pretty, um, they're set in that, that if you're doing a major subdivision, which is creating uh, three or more new building lots, there should be a provision for firefighting. It doesn't have to be within the subdivision. It could be with up to a, uh, I think it's a half mile away. I have to look at the regulations right in front of me. And the dry hydrant, the job right to buy a dry hydrant, either in a pond they make, an existing water source. There are a few different options there. Um, so there are people who think that a, a, a dry hydrant should be, a dry hydrant again is basically a pipe in a water source that's threaded the fire hydrant hook, in, hook the pumper truck into and pull water from. Uh, this came up most recently with the Bourne subdivision up Meadow Lane, which is across from the Bourne Sand Farm. Right now the closest water source to that subdivision is pretty much Bishop, Mar Bishop Marshall Rock Art right there at the end of the village line. So the pumper truck can be running relays from Rock Art to Irving right there. Um, in this case, the developer was required by the DRB to put a dry hydrant into uh, the Ryder Brook, right, the concrete bridge just to the north of the airport. That's just a minute or two away from the subdivision. That allowed the DRB to approve the nine house lots for now, which is probably going to be 11 or 12 in a couple more years when uh, the development is finally finished. There are people out there who argue that the town is overreaching because if you want to build houses in a rural area, you understand what you're buying. You're buying something that doesn't have a water source. So there is a debate on this one. The zoning does require a dry hydrant for major subdivisions, and I'm expecting uh, some discussion about that. 
Gary, not to, not, not to pick on you again. You want to start? Yeah, I'm ready. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's fine to require a dry hydrant, but one of the first prerequisites for a dry hydrant is you ought to have some water. And it's not all subdivisions. I mean, if you, um, oh, just for instance, if you subdivided, uh, oh, down on the Cochrane Road there somewhere, uh, where are you going to build a pond? I mean, it's. It's all sand down that way, and you know there's no there's no source of water, and you could granted and i i I did get permission from the state to uh install a dry hydrant there at the Blaisdell bridge, uh, which I guess we'll be able to do that in the spring uh we we ran out of time uh, it had to be done by I think it was the first of October or something or fifteenth maybe this year and it just uh, couldn't make it work but I did, it's pretty difficult to mandate a dry hydrant and I know we've had uh, several different subdivisions and requiring dry hydrants but there again there's no obvious water source you can't just dig a hole and put a dry hydrant in it and expect water to run to the dry hydrant where there isn't any. So it, I think it's, uh, I think it is an overreach. Uh, even, even some points, you know, half a mile, I don't know, probably, you probably could get into a brook somewhere within a half a mile of most developments, but is there water enough in the thing year round to, Provide fire protection. Um, I know they. I know Denny's got some requirements on that, and I don't know what they are off the top of my head. So uh, you know, you got to have so many cubic feet per second, I think, flowing down the river, but or at the source. Uh, but if you have a you know a small pond with a dry hydrant in it, it's got four or five hundred thousand gallons in it, and they're pumping a thousand gallons a minute with those uh, pumpers or more uh, you're going to exhaust that supply pretty fast so it i think it's pretty tough sell to to try to require dry hydrants and uh, people would have to understand that you're probably going to pay a premium on your fire insurance by building i'm pretty fortunate i'm uh i got a fire hydrant within 25 feet of my house so and so does the neighbor. But uh, I don't know if I would do any good or not. It might be so hot you wouldn't be able to hook onto it. I'm not sure. But uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of a lot of stuff, you know, engineering and stuff that would have to go into that to see if you could even uh, install a dry hydrant. I don't. I certainly don't have a problem with it where it's uh, where it's feasible to make it work. But uh to just the blanket um blanket blanket regulation to require any developer that develops over three lots to, to have to install a dry hydrant is i think a little bit much i i think you should you know give them the option but that's just my two cents worth Yeah, this is Bob. I think I'd, I'd agree with that too. Kind of like uh, requiring people to build a sidewalk to nowhere when there's no sidewalk anywhere around it. You guys love to discuss. Well, uh, that happens from time to time, but given That's given right. enough time, they'll they'll connect. I agree on the sidewalk. Yeah, we'll, we'll see, Gary. We'll the see, dry Gary. You guys, will have to, you guys will want to discuss this with the fire chief, Denny. Uh, Denny's a large proponent of this language and having a water source available. Uh, the planning council did rely on Denny very much in drafting this language on page 11 of your meeting package. So, uh, public comments. Any other public comments on this for the public hearing? Uh, the, this is Etienne. Would you mind just re reminding us of exactly why this came before the planning council? So with the uh, the I think we spent a couple hours in the little recession on the Bourne subdivision 
uh, that's right across from the fuel tank. So everyone under the one I just uh, referenced earlier off Meadow Drive. Uh, there's a contingent of the DRB that doesn't want to vote for any new development if it doesn't have fire protection. Uh, there's a contingent of the DRB like Gary just saying the fire needs to know what they're And if there's no fire protection, the fire department will do their best. There's no water resource in their buy or their dry hydrant. The fire department will do its best, but the fire may take longer to be put out if you're in a rural area without a water source. So that's where it really came from. The DRB at the time of that subdivision had trouble with the existing language in the zoning and was unclear about how to interpret it. The existing language has been there for decades. It's been untouched for the 10 years plus I've been here. So the DRB wasn't clear in the existing language. The DRB asked the Planning Commission to tackle revising the language so it was clear. Uh, the, uh, that's what you have in front of you tonight. There's a question if there is too much government control or not in the language. I can tell you the language makes the fire chief happy. Um, he thinks it will save structures and potentially lives, but uh, there's also the question of how much regulation is too much regulation. That will be for the select board and the trustees. It's more of a select board issue, it's not a village issue to decide what they're more comfortable with when they vote on this on January 4th. Does that, does that answer your question, Yeah, thank you. No, I just I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of, of the reason why we debated it to start yeah, off. Just, yeah, the planning council did just decide to write more regulations on this and add three sentences to it. We were requested to clarify the existing language. We worked with the fire chief to do so, and this is what came out of the sausage maker. Any other comments on that one? Now I'm moving on to uh, G, I'm sorry, H, remove studio uh, group one visual location from accessory parking definition. Uh, this is driven by a state statutory change. They're trying to make accessory apartments uh, more easy for people to seek permits for. And really, uh, we can't legally do that anymore, nor do we want to. So if you want to have two small bedrooms instead of one bedroom accessory apartment, as long as it meets the ratio discussed earlier, there's no issue with that after the zoning change goes through. So. That's more housekeeping under H. Um, under I, and the last two, I and J, are the Fairwood Parkway ones. Uh, the Fairwood Parkway neighbors met with the select board. Uh, they were kind of not pleased with the development this summer or not pleased how a zoning change shook out back in 2018 or 2017. I don't have the year exactly in front of me. So the select board told the planning council to change the zoning in the neighborhood. What this neighborhood change zoning change does, which is shown on page 14 of your package, the area being changed. It moves a large area of medium density residential, uh, largely medium density residential and the low density residential. The real change for the neighborhood perspective is in medium density residential, duplexes are allowed. In low density residential, which the neighborhood would go to, duplexes are not allowed. The minimum lot size in medium density residential is 4,000 square feet per unit. And low density is 10,000 square feet per unit, so it's two and a half times larger. So really, the neighborhood uh, is being downzoned from MDR medium to LDR low. And the real life ramifications on that are no more duplexes and uh, minimum lot size increasing from 4,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet. That's the gist of it. And I, I'm not sure if the select board members saw, I did get one. Um, one comment letter on this from Bob Henu earlier this evening at four, quarter of five. I think he sent that to the select board members. I sent it to Dan. I have that here if anyone needs me to read it. Please mute. Someone's got a lot of background noise. That's better. Any comments on this? Uh, Bob's letter I got today was opposed to the zoning change. I'm guessing it's the neighbors on the call who are probably uh, for the zoning change. Yes. So we're here, uh, Judy and Dick Shanley, wanted to say hi to Heather Hobart out of the past, uh, Phil Lovelies friend and co-worker, you may know him, in Duncan Tingle. Uh, 
anyway, we're just listening in tonight. So we're the Fairwood Parkway Rebels. <laughs> Any other comments? Rick's there, I think. I'm on board too. I'm I'm with uh, co-rebel with uh, Dick there, so <laughs> on the east side. <laughs> east side. <laughs> Better side. I'm sorry, I have nothing nothing to add to. I'm just listening on too. Also. So I guess if that's it, we'll move on. Do you have to do anything? So close the, you want to close the hearing? Okay. Sure there's no more comments. Last chance for comments, everybody. Thanks for doing this, Todd. Not a problem. Happy to help. Unless you want to keep the hearing open just until the 24th so you can uh, take any planning council changes on the accessory apartment line, which is up to you guys. You don't, need, you don't need the planning council, you can vote it yourself. Close this hearing and not keep it open. Yeah, fine. Okay, we're going to close the hearing tonight then. Someone needs to make a motion on that one and you need to vote it. So moved, this is Bob. Thank you all. Second. All in favor? Bob? Aye. Eric? Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy? Aye. Aye and aye. Thank you. It's closed. Thank you all. If you want me to check in on the December 21st hearing to answer any questions you guys might have as you mull what you're going to do for a vote, let me know. I'm happy to help. The uh, trustee hearing on the, the trustees heard this first on December 2nd. Uh, it went for a couple hours, but it ended up being okay. I think there's going to be support for most of, most of this, if not all of it, for the trustee level. I can't speak for the trustees, but. I think it should go through there. So any changes, you're going to vote first. Any changes on your end will flow to the village. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Todd, Gary, I'd just like to make sure you uh, let me know what the planning council come up comes up with tomorrow night, if you would, please. Yeah, I'll email it out Wednesday morning. Thank you. Okay, moving to new business, I guess. Nonprofit. Memorial Reference Center. Anybody there for that? The restorative center, was that what you were just referencing? I didn't hear you. Yes, I believe it was, yeah. Okay. Hi, Gary. So I will um, just quickly try to take a, a few minutes of your time. Um, I'm Heather Hobart. It's good to see some of my friends on the call. I'm the executive director at Lamar Restorative Center. Um, and I wanted to just give you a quick synopsis of all that we do um, and let you just ask questions. Um, so Lamar Restorative Center has been around for um, more than four decades. And we actually started as a um, juvenile court diversion program back in 79. We were the first county um, to start a court diversion program. So many of you know our court diversion work because it's been around the longest of all of the 12 programs that we have under our umbrella. And over the years, the community has come to us and asked us to work upstream from that, keeping people out of the justice system, sometimes even before they start glancing up against it. So some of you may know um, about the work that we do um, in schools. We have a um, school engagement program, which is very, very busy, as you can imagine, through COVID. Normally, we receive around 300 to 350 referrals um, a year. And this year, we're on track to um, receive about probably around 600, we think, based on the numbers that we've gotten at this point. Um, so. Uh, we, we do a lot of work with the court system as well. And um, most recently in the last five or so years, we've also started serving people who are 
um, returning from incarceration. So we serve sort of the whole spectrum. Um, the, the programs that we serve sort of upstream from the justice system, uh, people come to our office, many of them, in fact, more than half, um, come without any involvement in the justice system. For example, we might be um, helping people, young people find employment in our jobs program or people who are transitioning out of foster care in our youth development program. So um, it's a little bit of a, a confusing um, organization for some people because we do have a lot of justice involved programs, but we also have many, many that are not. Um, I just wanna say I really so much appreciate um, Morseville's contribution. Um, and uh, I welcome any questions that you have. I will say that um, the contributions that we receive from towns, most of our contributions come in the form of grants and contracts from the state, um, about 80%. And we have very, very little flexible funding. Most of that money goes directly to paying staff. Um, but money like yours helps us. Um, I actually just had a, 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 our truancy person, our social worker, tell me a story about a young man named Dustin who, um, this is a true story, and I couldn't have even made it up if I tried, who is nine years old, he has a disability, his mom um, is recovering from an addiction, and she has cancer. Her um, car has been, was stuck in the lot in her driveway for, since school started this year, um, and her ex, uh, the, her payments from um, her ex have not been coming because he actually lost his job through COVID. So they had no way to get this young man to school. He lives out in, in the Willy Wags and actually she had no way to get her cancer treatment. So we, with our the little tiny, tiny bit of flexible funding that we have, were able to um, help them get the financial assistance that they needed to be able to um, get their car running. Uh, and we also helped them with um, some food pantry stuff. So that's just a little example of the work that we're doing that some people are um, surprised to hear because it doesn't, Dustin had nothing to do with the court system, but we know that truancy is a direct link. If, if kids start missing school, they're much more likely to end up later on in the, in the system. So um, I just wanted to say, I really appreciate your support and would welcome any questions that you have and I'll stop talking. I did send a little one pager to Erica that um, or we did it earlier today that we're happy to share with you guys if you have any other questions. That's awesome, Heather. This is Bob Beeman. I think that's a great story. And I had no idea that the restorative center did things like that. And I just think that's, that's great for our community. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bob. Any other comments? Questions? I was curious about, this is Judy Bickford. Um, when you mentioned truancy, I know that's a big problem because of COVID. And is there something that the restorative services are doing throughout the state to help with that? There actually is no other truancy program. We're the only one like it in the state, Judy. And we're, um, I'm in communication. I was just on a call with the Deputy Secretary of um, Education last week because they are seeing a, a huge problem and they really want to get at it. But um, so we're working with other folks around the state to try to help replicate, of course, at the funding issue. But there are ways that schools can try to engage. People are really surprised to hear that in our pretty rural community, that um, technology is actually not the challenge. Most kids have access to the technology and the internet, not everybody, but most that they need. It's just getting kids to um, choose between YouTube and um, their PlayStation 4 and logging on to class. And I can tell you as a mom of a 13 and 10 year old kids, um, I can identify with that. <laughs> That's a challenge. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, Heather, this is Gary. I just I just want to uh, tell you to keep up the great work. Uh, you're doing a heck of a job since you got involved with that program over there and uh, just keep it up. Thank you for what you're doing. Thanks a lot, Gary. Heather, it's Eric Gods. I, I want to chime in as everybody else has uh, to, to thank you for what you do. But to tell you that I, ha I have a concern. This is in no way a criticism of your program in any way, shape, or form. But I am concerned that the, the justice system has been using this program or uh, 
in particular, your diversion program is a dumping ground uh, to try and alleviate caseload. I, I've seen cases headed that direction that, in my opinion, mm -hmm. do not either deserve a second chance of diversion or should not be heading there in the first place. Yeah. Um, and I know they've relaxed some of the, the guidelines that they're kind of flexible, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I sympathize with you folks in the work that you're doing with some of the folks you're dealing with who have been in the system repeatedly. And uh, so I, I would just tell you that, yeah, you have a sympathetic ear to that piece of it. So I see it daily. Um, just so you know, we do have an agreement with our pros each prosecutor that comes into office and we um, decide what referrals will come. So um, the other piece, Eric, that when I hear people asking about what's getting referred, um, we have a, some programs now that are serving people who are higher risk um, that uh are not necessarily in the court diversion program but we're looking to get them into for example mental health and substance use treatment so i just always ask people to um maybe look at the reason that folks are coming here and they still will get returned if they're not um, following through um and i'm happy to talk with you offline a little bit about that i know you know more than most about it thanks heller appreciate it any other I'd like to say that I've seen a lot of good uh, people come out of that, get help, and it's helped the community a lot. I'd like to keep up the good work. Is that Todd? Brian. Oh, Brian, thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes. I worked with a lot of them, Brian Shackett, and, and uh, I think that was a good program and it was a lot of good help. And uh, I just think it was a good thing. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, move into Lamoille Home Health. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. So I'm Kathy DeMars and I'm the Executive Director at Lamoille Home Health and Hospice. Um, I have been there for, I can't believe, almost 30 years. So I've seen a lot of changes mm -hmm. in health in the last 30 years. But I kind of wanted to tell you a little bit about who we are, what we do, um, the people that we see in the community. So we're a nonprofit home health and hospice agency. We have a local board of directors that governs us. Uh, we started, the agency was started in 1971, and I am only the third director of this agency in 50 years, which is really hard to believe. Uh, Joyce Fellows was the first, Ann Millette was the second, and I'm the third. So we've got a lot of longevity in our our administration for sure. Um, we are designated, we have a designated area that we can serve. We don't go outside of Lamoille County. Um, we just see people in this county and that's state regulated for us. Um, we have to follow all the state and federal regulations. We're surveyed regularly to make sure we're following all those things. So we're really tightly regulated, but our main mission is always to just take care of the community. Um, who do we see? We see pregnant moms, we see new babies, we see not so healthy babies, um, we see chronically ill people, we see surgical patients, we see hospice patients, we take care of really complicated wound care, we do IVs in the home, we take care of people on ventilators at home, we do pediatric palliative care at home, pediatric high tech. So we do a real wide range of services for, for the community. Um, we have currently 90 employees, um, and we have registered nurses, we have um, licensed practical nurses, we have physical therapists and occupational therapists and speech therapists and social workers. We have uh, nurses aides, personal care attendants. Um, we have billing and scheduling staff, as you can imagine. Uh, we have an HR, a couple people in HR doing work and finance. So that all adds up to 90 of us. The bulk of our people are all out on the road. There's only about 12 or 14 people in the office and everybody else is out making those visits um, every single day. And we're doing those visits absolutely every single day, uh, including holidays and weekends. Um, there's always a nurse on call and she's on call 24, there's nursing available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So our clients can call us anytime, day or night, if they have a problem, concern, issue or or just you know some sort of 
So we stay really busy, I, I have to say. Um, in Morrisville this year, we've made 11,871 visits in person. So almost 12,000 visits to the, to the folks in Morrisville this year. And then we also made almost 1,000 non-billable telephone encounters since COVID. One of the things that happened was the, we were told to stop a couple of our programs, but we didn't want those people to just be sitting out there with no connection to anybody. So we had staff in the office making calls to all these people for several months to make sure that they were doing okay at home. Um, had food, had heat, had whatever they needed. So that was a really important part I felt like we played to keep people safe at home. Since then, we've been back in these homes. We've been allowed to go back in. So that, that has been a good thing. Um, Countywide, we've done almost 44,000 visits. Um, the staff has driven 340,000 miles. Um, so they, they put a lot of miles on to see the people here. Um, and we've done 3,000 phone calls to people countywide. So the bulk of our people really, we have a lot of people in Morrisville that, that we take care of on a regular basis. It's been a tough year. I, I won't say it hasn't been. COVID has been extremely tough um, on staff. It's been tough on the community. It's tough on everybody. Um, and we've certainly felt the pressure at home health. You know, who do we see? Who don't we see? How do we make those decisions? How do we keep staff safe? How do we keep the clients safe? Um, how do we get enough PPE? The prices of PPE have gone absolutely crazy, if you can even get it. Um, it it's been a challenge. And on top of that challenge, we were hit with a cyber attack last November for our medical records. So we had a ransomware attack, our vendor. We were down for almost a month of no record whatsoever. Um, and we had to rebuild and we had to implement a new system. So in the middle of this whole COVID, we have implemented a new medical record our staff has. So I can tell you it's been, it's been a tough year for us, but we're still out there seeing all the people that, that we need to see. Um, I was thinking about what, why do we need some of this funding from towns? And part of it is we're seeing people with really high deductibles on their health plans, as you probably all can imagine, because I think we all have them, and they can't pay them. They just can't pay them. So we, we don't push that very hard. We make sure we see everybody regardless of their ability to pay. We're seeing people with no insurance at all. Um, we're seeing an increase in a homeless population. We're seeing people in cars. Um, we're seeing people wherever they need to be seen so that we can, we can take care of them. So this, uh, everything has sort of just changed in the last nine months of who we're seeing and how we're seeing them. But we're very creative and we've been seeing anybody anywhere that we can possibly, possibly see them. So that's sort of us in a nutshell. Um, we're really busy. We see a lot of people, take care of a lot of the community. We work collaboratively with all the community partners. Um, we have staff that go to Copley Hospital every day to make sure we take care of the people that are in the hospital. They come home with a smooth transition. So there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to, to make sure that we take care of everybody. So that's my really speedy version of what we do and would love to answer any questions any of you may have. Kathy, Kathy this is Judy. I, was, I was wondering how do people get referred to your services? Um, if it's a skilled service like nursing or physical therapy or anything like that, we have to have a doctor's order. Um, but people can, a neighbor can call us and say, my neighbor doesn't look well. We call, check on them, find out who the doctor is and go from there. So we do a lot of background work sometimes to get a doctor's order, but we have to have a doctor's order for skilled services. There's another program, Choices for Care, that you don't have to have a doctor's order, and we get those referrals generally from social workers, Council on Aging, those kind of organizations, and then we screen them from there. Kathy, this is Bob Beeman. I just wanted to say, I guess the word is thank you for your service. You know, you've been doing it a long time and your whole group is awesome. And I was also curious about, you know, if you have a neighbor that you you think might be able to use your services and uh, is not gonna reach out to you, what's the referral process, you know? Yeah, I mean, I would say, Bob, if you had a neighbor that you were concerned about, 
just call our office and one of the intake nurses would probably call them and see if they you know that we just had somebody say they were concerned and see if what they needed and then if they give us right. the okay then we'd call the doctor and say you know mrs smith would like us to come in and help her with whatever it may be right so it's pretty it's a pretty simple process then it's not that complicated there's it's complicated on the paper end work for us but it's not complicated for people to to get a hold of them that's great thanks other, kathy uh, thanks judy any other uh, questions or comments Gary, Eric, all set? All set. I'm all set. All set. Thank you. Okay. I've had another question. Thank you, everybody. Do you have um, any uh, data on the increase in homelessness or um, people who are struggling at home? How much of an increase there has been since COVID? I probably could pull that data. I can tell you that our census is up. We're seeing more people in general uh, because people don't really want to go into the doctor's office or the hospital. So we're seeing a lot more people at home because they feel safer. But I could get that kind of info for you, Judy, specific. I, I, I was just curious if you had it. I, it, it. I'm sure somebody has it out there that, uh, that there's a more homeless population than we had last year at this time. I, I can tell you that mental health and absolutely has those figures in there right in the palm of their hand. I want to think that we have 90 people that are living in hotel rooms right now. That yeah, I think, it's, I think it's 84 adults and almost 40 kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's gone way up. Last year it was 80 people total at this time, Judy. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kathy. Thank you, Bye. Brian. Hey, Justice for Dogs, Amy. Hi, I'm, I'm Amy Touchette. I'm president of Justice for Dogs. And thank you for choosing us to speak tonight and for all of your support over the years. Uh, Justice for Dogs is celebrating 15 years of helping local animals in Lamoille County. Um, we are an all-volunteer run rescue so all the money goes to caring for the animals and we don't take animals from out of state we are here for our local pets uh, in morseville we deal a lot with cats even though we put quite a dent in the population of feral cats uh, we deal with uh, feral and friendly kitties not as many dogs have come our way in morseville but uh, this year we did work on a, a dog hoarding case um, that we were able to kind of work out 22 dogs and stay and neuter some of the ones there but we worked with another organization on that um, another thing that we do in morseville is we help organize and advertise for the rabies clinic that's held in morseville each year we promote the VSNP program, which is a local, state-run, low-cost, stay and neuter program to encourage people to, you know, stay and neuter their pets. Um, we donate food uh, to people in Morrisville to help feed their pets during difficult times, and we've also provided some medical care and transport um, of pets that belong to seniors to the vet. Uh, we are a source of information for the community. We get tons of phone calls on all different things, and we try to help out wherever we can. And I think that's us in a nutshell. Um, if there's any questions, I'd love to answer them. Any questions for Amy? This is Brian Amy. Thank you. You've done a wonderful Thank you, Brian. Job. Nice to hear from you. Thank you. Um, but if there's any questions that arise, um, would love to answer them. And I know we've passed in our, you know, our budget report there and everything for the um, town meeting. Well, I've been working with you, so I know what you've done and all the good stuff you've done. So thank you. Great. Again. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for having us, and thanks for the support. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Amy. This is Bob. Yes, thank you, and have a good evening.
You too. Bye bye. Okay, let's go on to review delinquent taxes. Can you hear me from here? Okay. Nope. No. Not well. Can you hear me from here? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is this is Sarah. Um, I think you all have, I emailed the report of the current balance, um, balances due for the delinquent taxes that were due yes. um, for the 1920 year. These balances also have, if there were any carryover from previous years um, in them. And I'm coming to you to see what you would like to do. If you want me to turn them over to the attorney uh, to start proceeding tax sales. Last year, we started using Jim Barlow, who really is a specialist in um, municipal law. And um, what he did for us was uh, first he sent out a demand letter. And then after that, I um, brought the list back to you of the ones that hadn't paid that we brought to tax sale. Can only um, charge the property owner up to 15% of legal fees. He charges $75 per demand letter to send. Um, so that is why I have the breakdown of the $500 or more, just trying to figure out what makes sense financially, who to send letters to, who, who if there's anybody you don't want to. Um, but let me know if you have any questions or thoughts um, or any changes you might want to make to the current policy of how we've been doing things. Sarah, is this an unusual amount of people? No. Not really. Hi, Sarah. This is Bob. I think we should, my opinion is we should keep doing it the same way, you know. Okay. I was trying to remember if last year, I don't think that we sent demand letters to um, the business personal properties, especially because of the small amount. Financially, it didn't make sense. And I was trying to read back from the minutes about some of the um, unlanded mobile homes with small balances. Uh, yeah, we I, didn't. I don't think we did, but I couldn't find it in the minutes. No, I remember, Sarah, we didn't do that. It wasn't okay. worth it to us. Well, uh, this is Gary. It certainly doesn't seem like it would make sense to send a $75 letter to try to get a $70 tax bill paid. Correct. Yeah. Or a $10.22 one there. Yeah. What do you do in the past? Do you set a limit? Um, yeah. On who I'm you gonna... send, you know, a, a dollar value on uh, who you send these out to? Yeah, I think that we, I think that that's what we did. Last year was the first year of doing it this way. Previously, the other local attorneys, um, we, the town wasn't liable for the fees. They kind of did it pro bono. And so then last year was the first year that we actually um, had to pay the legal fees regardless if we could collect them or not. Sounds good. Sarah, I noticed on your list, there's two like lists on the um, um, attachment. And the second list, I, I understand why one might be highlighted. I don't understand in the bottom part of the um, email why the second one is highlighted. The 14. The page? Yes, the second page, the second highlight. I'm thinking the second page was just my notes. I think it's the same spreadsheet, but is that in alphabetical order? Yeah. Yeah. Ignore yeah, I think that's, yeah. 
it, yeah, ignore the second page. Those don't mean anything. It's that's just alphabetical order. Okay, thank you. Any more comments? So do we want a motion? Yeah, because I'm feeling like I need to know exact, exactly what you would like me to do. Right now, we would just be talking about the demand letter, the step one. So you need a motion to for us to say, we want you to send a demand letter to people who owe more than $75 in taxes. Is, is that and correct? Send it to Jim Barlow. That's your motion. Does that work? It, yeah, it's up to you guys. The motion itself works. I don't know the dollar amount that you wanted. That's why I'm here. Yep. So anybody. So your motion is anybody that owes more than seventy-five dollars, I will send to Jim. Um, to send a demand letter. Need a second. This is Bob. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, do you want me to send the one? There's only one business personal property. It's a very, very old bill. The bill is no longer, um, they no longer get a bill. I don't even know if we have a current address for them. So they, these are these are, not, these are not current back taxes. These are back back taxes. Some are also back. That one happens to be a very old back tax. And because uh, business personal property is almost phased out, they no longer and they're out of business. They haven't gotten a tax bill in a couple of years. I, I personally think that that one should go to the board of abatement the next time there's a meeting. Okay, do you need that in a motion? We have a we have a motion on the floor already. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think it should. Um, you should amend the motion if you agree with my suggestion to not include that one business personal property account. I so amend the motion not to include the personal business property account. Did I say that correctly? Yes, I'll second it. Okay, I have a motion and a second to amend the motion. All in favor? Bob? Bob says aye. Eric? Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy? Aye. Aye and bye. Okay. Okay, now we gotta vote on the motion with the amendment. All in favor say Bob. Aye. Eric? Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And the next thing. Sarah, excuse me, Sarah, this is Gary. Uh, do you think most of these are collectible or some of them been on the books for a long time? Um, a few, a few of the unlanded mobile homes have been on the books a long time. That business personal property has been on the books a long time. Um, I actually brought it to an abatement a year or two ago. It's that old. And at the time, the board of abatement didn't want to abate it. But uh, a couple more years have passed. I feel like it's time to bring it back. OK, but you think that's the only one you think that should be taken to the abatement? Uh, probably. I think the mo most. Okay. You know, sometimes the mobile, the unlanded mobile home ones take a long time. Um, but 
but I think eventually they pay. Yeah, okay. The ones that are, are landed homes, they usually, if they don't pay, unfortunately, some have sold at tax sale and then they do pay up then um, or somebody purchases the property. Sure, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next on the agenda is discuss town meeting. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but uh, the legislature passed um, uh, an act to uh, allow in 2021 boards to move any floor meetings to uh, Australian ballot, most uh, due to COVID. So we can't have more than 75 people indoors at the moment. It could change, that's just currently. So that is um, less than half of what we would have at a normal town meeting. So therefore, under the current regulations from the state under COVID, we couldn't have traditional floor town meeting as it stands. Um, so uh, I'm coming to you. I think that you all got some information from VLCT about um, moving town meeting to an Australian ballot. Um, I think Sarah and I are looking for some comments and direction from the board as we get ready to start working on the warning and getting ready to prepare for town meeting. Um, I, I think if you read everything, it's, it's you can't hold it remotely or virtually. Um, you would be limited to 75 people. Uh, I think I'm not going to speak for the school, but I think they would probably have some concerns about us being at the school, um, you know, and there's the, the everything that we would have to do to prepare for a town meeting. I think Sarah and I are both looking for some input back from the board on what you would like us to start working on for this year. It's, it's not that far away. I mean, realistically, you know, we, we start doing the warning and planning everything the 1st of January. Um, so based on all the guidance that the LCT has put together, well, the legislature has put together and then the LCT has helped summarize it. We need to hear from you guys on what you think is going to be the best approach um, to conduct town meeting. I think Sarah, if I'm correct, there's no authority yet to change meeting dates. No. And, and that could happen at the legislative cycle. It could not happen at the legislative cycle. So I think rather than confuse the issues about possibly moving the date, it's, it's kind of um, how do you want us what what are your thoughts i guess just um, about town meeting this year is the state yeah, proposing they would pay they would help pay for australian ballot today no i don't think that they have the authority to do that i know that it's sort of being um drafted looked at there's a committee of um clerks and the election division and some legislators um, laid in, uh, bodies that are looking at what maybe they could, but they can't vote on anything until the legislature is in session in January. I think it would yeah, be this more, is... um, sorry, Judy, I think it'd be more of a traditional, if somebody wanted to vote, just like for the school, um, they can still request an absentee ballot this time um, by just simply calling Sarah. I was wondering about the votes that usually happen on the floor. That's not going to have to be Australian ballot, then, isn't it? it that, yeah, that's what we're discussing. So we always have part Australian ballot anyways. The town has the select board members, and then if there's any sort of um, high purchase um, financing Cost. And then this, we do the school also, and there's the school board members, and then the school budget is always via Australian ballot. So we always have a ballot, and we always have an Australian ballot portion anyways. We're talking about the questions that 
usually happen on the floor, the um, officers that are usually voted on the floor, the town budget, the social service agency appropriations, all of those 20 different articles would um, be on a ballot versus a discussion on the floor. Yeah, this is Bob. I'm, I've been thinking about this a lot. I read this a while back and, you know, I think even though we may be on the brink of uh, having the vaccine widely distributed, um, because so much we have to do to prepare for town meeting has to be done fairly soon. I think that we have to assume that um, we may we may have to do this remotely or or do it um, in a way that's uh, that's a lot different than years past. You know, um, I'd love to see. You know, they talk about a little bit about um, the vaccine being distributed. You know, between the middle of January and middle of February, but you you can't bank on that. And even if you do, there's things that we've got to know now. I know you guys do that to prepare for it. And I, I'm just thinking that, uh, you know, it's only one year. I know some people might be upset, but we might want to think about the possibility of doing things remotely. You know, everybody is gotten into this, you know, this world we're living in now with Zoom meetings and work remotely for other reasons. And, you know, I think uh, town meeting may have to do the same thing for one year. I don't know, but uh, that's my opinion. So Bob, um we're not allowed to hold it remotely. But we're not at all. No, no. And it doesn't look like there's any legislature um, pending that they're even investigating to do it remotely. I think it's I thought you were talking about it. I think that's got to do with the integrity of somebody voting remotely. Um, right. Hard to, to say so, voting. So the alternative is just do everything Australian ballot and not have one. Yeah, I think it's, I think the choice is we have the floor meeting like we normally do. The issue is we can only have a maximum of 75 bodies um, today. That could change. It could be less. It could be more. Um, and um, of those 75 bodies, we need to have a location big enough to to have the six feet apart for social distancing, or we have to do it by Australian ballot. I'm curious, right. do you have any idea how we would handle the, when there's nominations from the floor, when there isn't anybody running for a position? So um, all candidates would have to submit a consent of candidate form. The legislature have waived uh, needing petitions, so nobody would have to go out and get a petition. They would simply have to sign a form that says they want to be a candidate on the ballot by a certain day, and then it would be just, um, which you all have done, it's the same form when you run as select board members, um, the one where you say how you want your name to be on the ballot. Anybody that wants to run for a position would have to submit that by the deadline and the name would be on the ballot. Judy, if, if somebody does not, if, if nobody runs for a particular office, they're still write-ins or after town meeting, select board has the authority to appoint somebody to an open seat. Okay, thanks to both of you. Hey, this is Eric, Brian. Uh, I, I just throw my two cents in that if, if in fact this is how we're going to do it all by Australian ballot, that we as a board need to come up with a plan to address the articles prior to the town meeting date Australian ballot, such that folks that have concerns or questions about any of the articles would have a chance to call into our meeting, ask questions about the articles, so there is any confusion on things. Um, I don't know what that looks like. I would leave that to, to Dan to kind of give us a framework and then we can fine tune it from there. If we have an Australian ballot, we're required to have an informational meeting. Um, I think 10 days, uh, 10 days or so before town meeting, there's a very specific time frame. 
Um, and that actually, I think, if I remember right, has to be a part of the town meeting warning. And then that hearing has to be worn in um, uh, a number of different ways. So there has to be an informational hearing um, where those things are brought out um, and, and the public is allowed to ask questions. That can be done remotely, just like we're doing a select board meeting now. Yeah, I understood. I'm just thinking that um, it's we may have, or we should plan to have a lot of participation because the because of the absence of the town meeting, such that we don't try and schedule it as a part of the meeting, but we make it the entire meeting. Correct. Um, just to let, to give you a perspective, most most towns that I've heard from are um, moving to Australian ballots. I know Stowe did. I talked to Elmore today. They're thinking about it. I know the school has it on their agenda next week. Um, but but towns small and large are for the most part feeling like they have to move to Australian ballot this year just because of trying to accommodate um, 75 voters or less is, is, is pretty hard with populations. Any further comments? I just think we need to be prepared for some criticism, which I am have broad shoulders can take. Um, from folks that uh, this this is just another step where they're going to feel like their uh, their their rights to uh, to uh, I don't know I'm trying to get too wordy about it they're going to be ticked off because we're once again if we took Fourth of July away we've restricted movement and that's not us we're we're mandated mandated by the state to do these things. You just think we need to be aware of the fact that there are going to be people very upset that town meeting is being uh, eliminated for Australian ballot. I agree, Eric. I think we should be prepared, but I think it's the thing we got to look into doing. So, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think the state's given us any other chance or any other alternative at this point. No, I, the, I mean, the governor even sent out letters today to all of us clerks, kind of encouraging it. I, th I think we have to look at it. It really isn't the government. It's the COVID. Therein lies the debate, Judy. <laughs> yeah. So, Bob, you want to go wear your suit? Right. So is there any more information that, that you would like Sarah and I to gather for you? I mean, we're, we're gonna have to look for a decision from you soon on this. Um, so is there anything else that you want us to gather um, or to help you to, just to answer questions or whatever to, so that you can make a decision soon on this particular item? I think if Sarah continues to like whatever information she's getting from other town clerks and what the rest of the state is doing and feeding that us that us that information to us would be good. What do you what do you mean? Can you be more specific by what you're looking for? Oh no, I'm not looking for anything, Sarah. I think the the guy the die has been cast. I don't think we have a whole lot of options available to us. And if we know that the majority of the towns and all the towns in in the state are going Australian ballot. Um, I don't think there's any other options available to us, but I'm just saying if you you hear of anything else going on, just sharing it with us. Okay. Yeah, if we can't have it remotely, then it should be just Australian ballot. That's the way it is. This letter from Vermont leads to cities and towns is zero by the look, so mm -hmm. it probably will help us get the questions we need to you. I would think. Yeah, this, if you haven't had a chance to read the town meeting uh, COVID-19 um, frequently asked questions guideline is very clear. I had a lot of questions. I really was unsure about it. And this document answered all of the questions I had. 
Yeah, I just read it, Sarah, after you told me about it, but no. And uh, it does sort of answer yeah, everything. It's, yeah, it's pretty plain, I guess. One word answer, no. Yeah. 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 Um, and they've had, uh, I was on their website today too, and it, they've um, updated it and they've added more pages about Australian balloting and um, because there's some small, small towns, we at least usually have, we have the Australian ballot for some of our officers, but there are small, tiny towns that have never done Australian ballot for anything that uh, they don't even know where to begin. And so the VLCT has been really putting out a lot of information. So on their website, there's, there's additional information if you have questions. Thanks, Sarah. I know I could vote right now to just say go Australian ballot. Yeah, I'm in. Uh, I'm in the same position, uh, Mr. Gary. I I don't know if we got any recourse. That what else are we gonna do? Right. Is there? Can I agree? I think we need to give Sarah maximum amount of time to prepare, prepare for this. So I don't see any reason for us to delay. We'll make a motion. I make a motion that uh, town meeting uh, be uh, foregone this year and in place all articles that would come before the voters be voted on by Australian ballot. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Bob? Aye. Eric? Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy. Aye. Aye. So Pat. Can I, I do think it would be good. Sorry. It, it it would be good for anybody that reaches out to us um with displeasure about it to give them this Vermont League of Cities and Towns that you're telling me about. Send it to them. And and um although it won't be at the time of voting per se, but People still will have the opportunity to speak, voice their opinions, voice their gratitude, um, voice their dissatisfaction <laughs> at um, the informational meeting. That the informational meeting will serve the same purpose as town meeting. They'll just be voting a few days later, not not at that at that same day. But they'll still have that out outlet for the discussion. That will not be taken away. Are you referring to anyone in particular, Sarah? No. <laughs> not at all. Good job. Good job. Um, can that be done virtually? That can be done because there's no voting taking place at the time. Um, that can be, and it's in the um, it's in that VLTC. Doc, yeah, I'm Doc. sure it is somewhere. I'm re I'm looking through it again. I read through the thing once, but uh, there's quite a lot yeah, there to it. absorb. There is a lot in it. Actually, I wanted to bring up also while we're discussing this document, um, the last thing is um, bullet point is about can voters use electronic signatures on their petition? Um, I don't know if we're are we allowed to talk about that or no? no? Exactly. I don't see why not. Um, so that people have been emailing me and Dan and I think Erica too about um, uh, the, the social service agencies and the petitions and people that either want to be a new agency on the list or they want to um, up the appropriation that they currently get and that during COVID it's hard uh, to gather signatures and they're asking about electronic signatures. So the the legislature hasn't said yes or no, but they've given the authority to the select board to decide and vote whether or not they want to allow electronic signatures on petitions or if they want to keep them um, standard quo to be paper. Um, yeah, I think we should vote on that too right now then. And I, I don't really um, have a recommendation one way or another, but I've been asked it so many times lately 
I feel that it's my due diligence to ask the board um, if they want to make any changes to their current policy. I I just read that paragraph as well, Sarah. And um, if the other board members want to do too, I don't have a problem um, making a motion to do that as well. There's no problem with it. It feels like being in between a rock and a hard place with this because we can't ask people to go out and get, get signatures when we're supposed to stay six feet away. Um, and I'm 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 just not I'm not familiar with electronic signatures. What is the, our pleasure? What are we doing? Make a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we uh, we approve the practice of allowing electronic signatures for petitions this year or for 2021 town meeting. This is for uh, the list in the back, right? Mm -hmm. The only thing, right? Well, social service appropriation. Okay. Is that what you meant, Bob? That was my motion. Would they still have to get the same number of signatures as they would have gotten pre-COVID? Yes. Do I have a second? I'll second it, Mr. Gary. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Bob. Aye. Eric. Aye. Eric. Aye. Judy. Aye. Aye. That's it. This is that motion is just for this twenty twenty one town meeting, correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. Review the contract for the audit there. Audit. So this is Tina. Um, I prepared a audit proposal for you so that you could take a look at what we've paid in the past for audits and who bid this year um, for the next three years who took the, did this RFP. So you'll have that in front of you. Um, the thing that I'd like you to take a look at especially is the estimated hours because uh, Sometimes it, it varies quite a bit. Um, uh, Glenna Pound did our audit and she's done our audit. You actually have the audit reports in your mailboxes now. Um, in the past, she's done our audit. Mudget, Janet Crow Wisner's done it. Um, the other two have not. Um, and you'll notice that their hours, estimated hours, are quite a bit lower. So, I mean, I. I'm concerned about that because if they go over their hours, they could potentially charge us more if there's not something in their contract saying they won't. Um, the only one that has something in their contract saying that they will not charge us any more and could potentially charge us less is Mudget Dennett Crow Wisner. Um, and Batchelder said that they would not exceed that the first year. So um, I just, I've worked with Cattell Brannigan Sargent before. They're a good firm. I have not had much experience with Batchelder. Um, Mudja is, is a very good firm. They did our audit for quite a few years, nine, I think. And um, we haven't had them for probably six years now, but 
they were very, well, no, more than that, nine years, because he has had different ones. Um, I myself have looked at all the proposals and I feel most comfortable with Mudget, Zenit, Crow, Wisner. I know they're not the, the um, least expensive, but I feel like they have a really good staff. Uh, uh, they have an, a, a lot of people that um, would be, they'd be able to devote quite a bit of time and give us the attention that I feel our audit would deserve. And um, I think that that's very important. Yes, uh, Tina, this is Bob. I am. Um, I looked at that too. I actually reached out to Glenna, and mm -hmm. I talked to her a couple weeks ago about the whole audit and everything. And and I agree with you. Um, I remember, you know, speaking with Mudget, Mudget, Janet, uh, Crowiesner. They had done it for quite a while, and um, I thought they did a really good job for us. And I was also looking at the hours, and you know, the cheaper price is uh you know only 98 hours and the other one's 125 when you know the other two are 180 to 200 and i just don't want to pay a lower price and have them not catch everything or have them go charging us on the back end or something and um i'm very comfortable with uh going with mudget for myself well, I know they do a quality audit for sure. And I want to make sure that the town, even though we may be paying more, that we're actually getting a good service for what we're paying for. And, and I would feel comfortable more with get them than um, others. Right. You know, do you have any idea what, um, how many hours we should be expecting our audit to be? Well, I, it is hard to know that. Um, I would say based on what these people have quoted, I know Mudget, when they um, quoted their price to us, they went back to see what, what type of hours they had spent in the past. So I'm thinking somewhere around the 200 mark is about accurate. Um, but I think, you know, some people, you know, put down 200 hours, but might spend 50. So... I, I don't know. And then when they bill, they don't write down, or in the past few years, we they haven't said how many hours anything was. It was just a dollar amount. So it's hard for me to know in the last six years what we've spent, how many hours we have paid for, I guess I'll say. Right. Thank you. Tina, Eric, is hey, there totally. the, 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 the amount that they, uh, the amount of hours they estimate, if they come in under that, is that all we pay, or are we paying that full amount that they're estimating? With Mudget in their proposal, they had a caveat that said if they work less than the 192 hours a year, they will charge us less. If they work more, they will not charge us more. That's so very they, fair. Yeah, the 58.5 is the very most you'll pay for three years. Are we looking for a motion on this? Um, yes, I, I think that got included in your packet too. Yes. Do have a motion, Eric? That's you, Eric. Yeah, I'm, I'm had, believe me, on this uh, cell phone, this is all. Going back and forth between pages is not uh, ideal. All right, I'll, I'll make the motion. This is Bob. I'll Thanks, move Bob. to award the three-year contract for audit services to Mudget Jennett Crow Wiesner for a total price not to exceed 58500 for fiscal years ended 2021, 2022, and 2023. I have a second. I'll second it. I'm scary. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Bob? Aye. Eric? Aye. Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy? Aye. So pass. Thank you.
update the personnel policy? Um, what I have done, there has been some confusion recently in some of the wording of our personnel policy. We, um, we refer to what they call permanent part-time, and there's been confusion as to what that is. I think the intention of it was to indicate it was for people that are regu regularly scheduled to work 24 hours a week or more with what I think the intent of the permanent part-time was, but I think it's a poor choice of words because other people have been very confused by that. So most of the proposals that I have in here take out that word permanent and actually describe what type of part-time person we're talking about. So the word permanent has been removed to make things clearer, basically. I appreciate that because it confused me. It is very confusing. I, I just think that it, permanent part-time was supposed to be a part-time employee that was eligible for benefits, but I think that's too confusing. That sounds good. The only other change that I did make is um, under Section 21 that doesn't have to do with permanent part-time was to include the highway superintendent under the Plan C, which you have already voted to do, but it never got updated in the personnel policy amendment. So I just included it here because we were already updating Section 21 anyway. All right. For Ready a for a motion? Yeah. I move. I move to amend the personnel policy, section 18, section 21, section 22, and section 23, as presented and authorized and authorized Bob Beeman to sign on behalf of the select board. Can you change that to Brian? Make it Brian. Oh. Um, scratch Bob Beeman. Replace it with Brian. <laughs> I didn't know Bob wasn't going to be here. <laughs> I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Bob? Aye. Eric? Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So done. Okay. Okay. Errors and admission. Um, we sent you an errors and admission via scan today um, uh, from the listers. Uh, and really, what this is, is, this was a change in the current use status of a property at the state level. So there's really not a lot of choices on this. This particular property is back, a part of this particular property is back in the current use status. Promotion. You guys got copies of it? Yeah, yeah. I, have to, I have to find it again. I'll make a motion that we approve the omissions and errors and omissions as presented. Second. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Bob? Aye. Eric? Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy? Aye. Aye. Go ahead. Um, when everybody has the opportunity, please stop by to sign this. Um, we do, we need signatures, at least three signatures on this. Um, can't authorize just one member of the board to sign this particular document. We can't get Brian. Yeah, I can't do it for 10 days. <laughs> also, don't forget to pick up your stuff in your mailbox because you've got your audit and everything that's in there. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Welcome. Okay, application 
Transportation Advisory Committee. Transportation Advisory Committee. I think that's up. Judy, would you like to speak to your recommendation for appointing somebody to the uh, uh, Regional Planning Commission's House, uh, Transportation Advisory Committee? Yes. Her name is Hannah, F A R D A. Um, I did not quite sure how to pronounce it, Farda. And she worked the, um, the polls this past election in November. Um, and so I asked if she would like to join us on LCPC to be on the transportation uh, subcommittee. Um, I thought we could do just a switch, but I guess we can't because um, I was kind of hoping that she could fill in. We have a, a vacancy from the village. And I, I know Bob is serving on the LCPC, and he, the village has to recommend their own representative. So we can't just do a switch around. Right, Dan? That's correct. Not as easy as I thought it was going to be. But anyways, Hannah has agreed to serve in that position. And she, she's young and interested in being involved in the community. And I think she'd be a good asset um, for this position. Judy, what does this transportation? This is something that Dan brought to us that we needed to have someone. Um, wasn't this what you brought, Dan? LCPC was looking for a representative to serve on the transportation subcommittee. I guess I'm not, I'm not sure what the transportation subcommittee does. Maybe, maybe you should serve on it, Eric. Well, I'm just, Bob, well, here, I'm just going to. I want to involve, if somebody wants to get involved in, in, in our government system here at the town level, I encourage, that's awesome. I just want to make sure we're not setting her up for failure, putting her in somewhere that they're talking about stuff that she's not familiar with at all that would give her a, a, a learning curve that's so steep. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm just curious what this committee, that, what does this committee do? Is this about, uh, is this about way, a, a water runoff on our roads? Is this about classification of roads i'm not sure what this committee does right that's a good question and do you have any thoughts on this because i don't i don't th i think it's more about like the the um the bus i was looking at it as a bus system i wasn't looking at it as road construction it does have a lot to do with road construction um state paving plans um bridge priorities um, it does, Eric does have some to do with the, 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 the state regulations on um, stormwater for roads, um, general permits along those lines. Um, uh, it, it can have some to do with, with buses, but generally speaking, not that much. Um, it, it can do, um, like, uh, they, they do assess or, or discuss, you know, um, accessory facilities like sidewalks and bike paths. Um, so thank you anything the agency of transportation does and this committee is kind of the regional committee that would advise the agency of transportation what the region's needs are for transportation to include town policies and eric i don't i don't know that i mean i i was new to the select board and um and also lcpc and and both bodies have been very patient with the learning curve. And I know that um, the people in the LCPC have been willing to work with anybody new coming on and bring them, bring them up to speed. Yeah, I agree, Joe, I, and that's not my issue. I really don't have an issue. I just, I want to make sure that this person who's looking to get into the government process doesn't step into something that's a giant hole and they get discouraged and then walk away. So that would be my concern with that piece. I guess I'm just would encourage her to reach out and and discuss. You know, keep the board informed. Um, that that's in, that is huge. Uh, in fact, a lot of our tax dollars are going to be heading in that direction, the transportation direction, over the next ten years. So it's, it's really an important position within LCPC. Um, so I don't have a problem with her doing it. I just want to make sure she has resources available to reach out to. If she has questions that can't get answered at the board level there. 
Okay, and I'll, I'll ask her to, you know, when she is in the subcommittees and if she can come right back and report to us. Would that help? Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I, again, I, I don't want her to get discouraged and, and walk away. And I want her to have resources available that uh, she could reach out to by phone uh, if need be and, and to discuss things that they're discussing there to help her understand it. Uh, Dan in particular, I mean, Dan is our, our go-to person and uh, he knows where to get answers uh, that others don't. So. Uh, I'm also going to include Kevin in that list. Uh, you know, Kevin Skyager working on our local roads and a lot of the policies that come out of this at the state level especially um, will affect Kevin to a huge degree. And um, especially when you're looking at the, the bridge inventory and the state paving list and how some of those grant um, opportunities really work not necessarily what the state wants you to believe on how they were. Yep. Hey, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Bob. Aye. Eric? Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy. Aye. 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 Next. <clears throat> Any more old business? No, no. Budget hearing. Review the highway budget. We have Kevin up to the table Aye. now, too. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. The lucky guy, you. Yes. <laughs> so, you want to go through page by page? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so starting with the Highway Capital Equipment Fund. We usually do capital later. Yes. Oh, do capital after. Yeah, we usually have one meeting that just talks about capital stuff, so we just do the operating budget usually first. So we're on page one. Anybody have any questions on page one? Nobody? Uh, not, not a question so much, just pointing out that uh, that's probably the, the uh, salaries is one of the largest increases within the budget that we are looking at. But, uh, you know, the explanation is the restructure that we've done this year, uh, appointing Kevin as superintendent, which opened up uh, a leadership position within the highway garage. So um, that, I think, Dan, unless I'm incorrect in saying that, I think that's where our increase in uh, salaries has come from. Yes, our our salaries um, line item is a budgeting an additional person. Now we have 13 people. This would be budgeting a 14th position. This 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 budget adds another person to the highway yeah. department. It also does take into consideration Kevin being the superintendent permanently. And then on page one, go to page two. Any questions? All set on page two. Going. Page three. Any questions on page three? Hearing none, let's go to page four. Kevin, I was wondering is, is Kevin, I was wondering, is there an increase in the budget due to the move to the new building? There is. We just haven't got to it yet. Questions on page four. 
a lot of this looks really good here. Page five. Any questions on page five? I have one. What signs at the top? Those are the portable radar signs, um, PD and the highway. It seems how it's a highway sign. Yeah. Um, it's why it's in my budget, but it's something that PD has uh, gone out and, and looked up and got one of the better prices around that I could find myself. Um, so that's why there's an increase. Those are the radar signs. Um, yeah, we, uh, this is something I've been working on for years. <clears throat> Just so I can have the chief come up. I've been working on the signs for a number of years, trying to find resources, funding, the type of signs, and so on. And these signs are fairly similar to what you're seeing now in Johnson and Hyde Park. And, you know, they're they're a basic feedback sign, which is on a post. Uh, the ideal set situation would be to have a, a couple of the signs that, that would be mobile, if you will, so you have you know, different hookups and you could move them to different locations. So four signs could cover as many as six locations at a time. <clears throat> so that's my thought process. Due to funding, I, I, we haven't been able to find a, a grant that, that funds for what they call a feedback sign, which is what these are. So I, I requested that the highway department consider putting that in their budget. And it certainly would help, you know, obviously with our speed control. It also would help with our staffing, you know, so it basically takes the place of a, a cruiser sitting out there doing radar. So that's where that came from. And that's four of them? Four of them. But you wouldn't have to have all four if, if we wanted to. I would recommend try to do four, but you know whatever we can, you know, start with. Yep. So they're I think about four thousand a piece, four thousand five hundred a piece. They're not cheap. No. I intend to still put it by another uh, uh, radar trailer. So that I do have access to funding. So you know we'll have that addition. I just that's that's quite a jump of what I asked for. Right. From four thousand last year budget. 23. Yeah, well, that's why I'm here <laughs> to answer that. Okay. And the next one I wanted to ask on the same page is the discharge permit. That last year was 27, went to 10,000. Yes, um, and that's because we're paying more to the state for stormwater discharge permits. So we, we'll just stop discharging it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from anybody else? Any questions on page five? Thank you. Page six. That's it. So Judy, that's where you can see that uh, the village garage lease uh, is in there at $96,350. Okay, where, tell me where that is again. Uh, oh, I see it. I see it. Never mind. Hey, Kevin, can I ask a question on page two? I, I just wanted to know if I'm not calculating this right or not. Uh, under the diesel fuel column, the, the numbers fluctuated greatly between 19. Uh, 20 and the proposed. So I'm, I'm just curious uh, about the, the estimate. Is that just based on fuel price itself? Because it looks to be the 1819 per gallon price is roughly the same as what it is now, or what we're projecting it to be. So why is there such a difference that there's almost $30,000 in difference there in the budget? Well, uh, last year, uh diesel was higher than this past when we did our budget yep and it's gone down obviously this this year and taking in consideration what our actual was for the 2019 2020 
um, felt it was a, a safe bet to uh, drop it down just a little bit. Also, you look at the usage, Eric, because in 1920, we didn't have the actual figures when we actually budgeted for that. So we only used 33,000 gallons in 1920, but when we were budgeting for 2021, we didn't know that. So we budgeted 45,000 gallons and we used a lot less. That's why our, the amount that we budgeted for the year we're talking about went down drastically from the 2021. Okay. So, do you have the final gallonage for 2021? Uh, no, we don't because we're still in that year right now. We won't know that. Oh, okay, yet. I'm sure. Yeah. But I, I can tell you that the prices are a lot lower than I've seen them in a long time. We just got a bill, I think it's in your stuff to approve, and the highway portion of the, the Valley bill is like $3,500 or something. It's a lot less than I've seen for quite a long time. That's a good thing. <laughs> yes, it is. Any more questions? Thank you, Tina and Kevin. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, moving along to liquid control. Control, I guess there's nobody here. Um, approve the warrant. So moved. And Eric? Yes. Bob, I'll second it. Bob, second. Any further discussion? Can you also authorize Brian to sign for the select board, please, for the warrant? I thought that's what Eric did. Oh, yeah. I probably cut out during my transmission there, but I did say to have Brian sign. <laughs> <laughs> some of there's some advantages to meeting this way, right, Eric? <laughs> there, there is, to include eating dinner while we're having a meeting. <laughs> yeah. I, I tried to kick you under the table, but you weren't there. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Bob? Aye. Eric? Aye. Gary? Aye. Judy? Aye. Ryan? Aye. So approved. Uh, TA report. Sure. Um, good news from Tyler today. Um, finally, on the two Hamel Fed Act 250, it looks like the, the hearing will finally be scheduled sometime in January. Um, so it will be a virtual hearing. Um, they, they have to go back to the legal counsel. We'll see if that was going to be legal or not, and it is. So it will be a, a virtual hearing, um, kind of like the pre-hearing that we have, but this will be the actual hearing. So um, we should have a list of the issues that they really want to discuss with us. Hopefully um, next week, I think is what Tyler said. So as soon as I get that list, um, I'll, I'll put that list out. Tyler and I have already started talking about something. I, I think you can pretty much guess, you know, just from the other meetings that we've had with the Act 250, um, what those discussions will be. Um, but it is finally moving forward, and I want to thank the select board's help um, for helping us with that because it was been really kind of a patient stressing thing there. Um, and will that meeting be virtual? I know you said virtual. Is it also going to be um, uh, visual? Yes, and I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. It will be visual. Um, the other thing I really want to touch on, I know Paul sent out an email. Um, to everybody last week about com computer security. Um, I just want to kind of restress that at this meeting. Um, um, there are people out there right now that are actually targeting um, us via email hacks. And, and you may get an email that appears to be from a member of the town staff. And unfortunately, lately, it seems like they've been picking on either Paula or 
Patricia. If it looks suspicious, do not open it. Call us um, so that we can do it. We're, we're putting the proof point back on. Um, we did have some problems with it um, the previous time around that we had it installed. Um, not everybody did. Some people worked fine. Um, but uh, SimQuest has said that they made some mistakes on their end when they did it. Um, and we kind of honestly, we made some mistakes where we have problems. We need to let them know right away that something's not working right. So as we go back to this proof point for your email, if something's not working like, let us know right away so that we can get it addressed. Um, but there's a real danger uh, of not having the security system on our email. Um, and as you just heard from, I think, one of the, the nonprofits, there are people out there that are looking to attack our computer system. Um, and you know, it, it would shut us down. It's not just our email system. It's, it's the ability to shut down our whole operating system. And you know, that would be a real detriment to what we do around here. Tina just is kind of gone. Yeah, because it, it would be, I mean, you, you just got to think of you know, our finances, everything that we do, we're getting ready to come up on you know, elections. It would be uh, horrific for us to lose you know, our whole computer system. So please just pay attention to what you, you click on and you're open. If you're not sure, call us. Um, it's not a big deal. We'd rather have you be safe and call us and then open up um, something and jeopardize our computer system. Um, the audit is complete um, and it's available here in the office for you to pick up and review. So if you get an opportunity to do that, um, please do so. I think it'd be better for you to have the audit. And then I think if maybe Tina could go over some sections of that, you know, that are um, for you just to, to look at and understand what it means. Uh, an upcoming meeting, we can do that. But I'd like to see you stop by and pick that up so that you could do that. Um, and video capability. There was a miscommunication between me and, and SimQuest on getting this set up. He, we were trying to get something that was kind of cable free. He couldn't find it and he delayed or you know, getting me the right list. Um, but I got that rectified. Um, in fact, it is the stuff for us to be able to do video conferencing has already started to arrive. I'm very, very confident that before the next select board meeting, I'll have that up and operating. So um, we're moving forward on that video capability. Um, the other thing too, just so you know, once we have that set up, um, Green Mountain Tech will be carrying our meetings live. Um, so they'll, they'll be able to, to live stream our select board meetings once we're done with that. So I've already talked to them. They actually reached out to me and let me know that once they, we start doing that, you know, our, lead, our meetings will be live. I think it'll probably change a little bit because people will be able to call in during the meetings a, a little bit better as well. So they'll be able to see things too. So that's um, great. Yeah, just so, uh, and they'll still play video back on that, but the, the meeting will be live at that point in time once we start doing it. So, um, and that's all I have for right now. Any questions for Dan? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. What more concerns, Bob? Um, well, I just wanted to thank Brian for stepping up tonight. Um, you know, we, we hadn't planned on this last minute, but I actually was sitting in my tree stand in Ohio and all of a sudden I realized, boy, I can't go into the meeting, you know, Monday night. I've got a I've got a quarantine, so um, I'm glad he stepped up and you did a great job, Brian. Thank you. Eric. I just I, I give honorable mention to uh, Dave Giacomoni for the help with the uh, uh, the kick in the pants to the Act 250 Commission. Uh, he did so in such a very gentle manner, as Dave is well known for. Uh, but the message was was sent and effective. So Dave, uh, they did Dave did us another good turn. Um, I'll also go uh, you know, the topic here. This virtual meeting thing. I've talked to Dan. It doesn't work for me. Uh, I get as much out of uh, visual communication as I do verbal, uh, and I have a hard time sometimes reading um, the intent of folks without seeing their facial expressions through nonverbal communication. So. I'm probably going to attend board meetings from here on out, and I know that will be an inconvenience to some, but I uh, I just can't do this over the phone thing. It drives me nuts trying to switch back and forth between documents, too. Oh, so you don't want to eat dinner and be at the meeting at the same time? 
<laughs> well, until they start running the live video at our meetings, I'll bring my dinner in there and eat it. <laughs> mm. Just have to bring it up for all of us, Eric. <laughs> okay. That's right, Dan. At least dessert. Okay. Thank you, Eric. It's all... it's scary. Uh, no, I don't have anything. Uh, Dan, that uh, virtual capability probably won't be ready for my DRB meeting on Wednesday, will it? No, it will not. Okay. Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Judy? Yeah. I was asked to bring up the um, money that Hyde Park is charging our town for the increase what increased taxes due to the sewer upgrade in Hyde Park. I'm not saying this all right. Anyways, I brought up the LCPC and it's not something that they deal with. Um, are we doing going to be doing anything differently? Um, Dan, are we up, are we going to be um, consulting with a, uh, a lawyer? Just really, we don't have any party status in this. Um, I mean, what's going on right now is Hyde Park Village is increasing their sewer meter fees to the courthouse, which right. raises the county tax. So right. and if the county tax goes up, it's, it's portioned out to the various towns in the loyal county. So we really don't have any party status. I know the side judges have already, I think that's what Eric has relayed to me, the side judges have already contacted um you know an attorney i believe eric correct me if i'm wrong and as far as a party status for the town you know we we get a portion of the county tax we don't have a choice but to pay it we got notification from um the county court that they anticipate our portion to go up about sixty five hundred dollars from last yep. year yeah. The, uh, the, the side judges have uh, retained an attorney uh, at this point and are fighting the increase. But Dan's right. We we just are in a sit and wait uh, status. The sixty five hundred dollars to our taxpayers is um, is uh, it's it's minuscule, but it's it's money that I don't believe we should have to pay. And but we have to let the the attorney for the side judges fight that. I, we're in a better position than some because anybody who is a part of the Loyal North Supervisory Union in their tax bill, uh, you know, the high school, the High Park Elementary School and the High Park Fire Department are all being increased substantially. So the folks in those tax regions are going to take a bigger hit than we are. But uh, nonetheless, $6,500 doesn't need to leave the town to pay for Hyde Park's upgrade, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. I was also wondering, Dan, I don't like to bring this up. What's the process going forward? Because you're leaving us soon, and I'm kind of, kind of nervous about this. <laughs> um, what I hope to do is I'll have a, an ad ready for the select board to view. I probably have it ready for the next meeting so that we can post the, um, of the job in January. Um, once again, I think, you know, uh, my goal was to have the ad out in January and then the select board um, able to review resumes and do interviews sometime in the mid to late March timeframe. And I think that's what we had discussed before. Thank you, I'm giving you a thumbs up. Okay. So yeah, you know, um, probably the other thing that I may do over the next couple of days and actually I'll ask Tina to do this, I'm gonna send out my job description to you. And I think it would be handy for this, the board at this point in time to review that job description and see if there's any changes um, that you would want to make to it. And I'll take a look at it too and see if there's anything that I feel like should be changed uh, between the, the time that you, uh, between now and the time you do interviews, but that it, it's updated. I, but as I remember, I don't think there's too much that needs to be changed in there, but it's always a good time to look at it. Yeah, that's kind of a big file you're going to be sending. So send it late in the day, please. <laughs> can do that. Dan, I, I do. 
I, Brian, I do have one alibi here. I, I, I meant to ask Dan uh, the status on the bathrooms down at the uh, Oxbow. It's a good question. I don't have that right now. Kevin, do you have an update on that? You know, if they support the walls or the walls, the floor are in. There's still no roof on it yet. Okay. We'll follow up. I'll, I'll follow up with Trish and, and get a little Donnie and see where he's at. Okay. Thank you. They're probably cold if you go down there tonight. Yeah, don't use them now. <laughs> a little colder there than on Butternut Mountain in deer season. So. <laughs> Okay, so I have none. Any other business? There are none. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Wow. Wow, Judy, you're right on that one. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Great job. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.